Hi everyone, and today we're going to continue with our studies of political economy by looking at Galbraith. So um, basically, last time I did promise to spend a week or a unit on studying neoclassical economics, because I think it's important that we do hear the arguments for free market capitalism and um, why maybe we should listen a little bit to mainstream economics. And I'm glad it's over because <laughs> there's much more interesting things to talk about. And Galbraith is certainly way more interesting than that. Um, as an economic theorist, he's pretty hard to categorize because uh, on the one hand, he definitely supports capitalism. Um, but on the other hand, um, most of his theories, most of his key concepts would be equally relevant for a non-capitalist society, so for a socialist society. And that's kind of what makes him interesting is that Galbraith sort of stands uh, in between or above capitalism and socialism in a way. So what makes Galbraith interesting? A few things. Um, I've included some less relevant details at the top. So he's probably the longest living economic thinker. He was 97 when he died. So um, he's also probably the tallest economic thinker, six feet nine or 206 centimeters, you know, it's kind of unusual to meet a person who's that height, generally speaking, uh, meeting a person that height who's also a world famous econo economic mm -hmm. thinker is kind of weird as well. Um, but he was distinguished by being a public intellectual. So he wasn't just all about publishing journal articles and things like that, that only other academics would read or, or people like that. He wanted to spread his knowledge as widely as possible. Um, and so his, his work was directed at being, you know, suitable for a public audience. Um, another interesting point is that he started out in agricultural science. So his first degree was a bachelor of agricultural science and he majored in animal husbandry. So taking care of animals and raising animals for um, farming purposes. And um, he did really well in this degree and that got him a scholarship to Berkeley and he ends up in agricultural economics, you know, and as a result of this, he becomes a professor at Harvard University um, and ends up on a fellowship where he goes to Cambridge University and it's here he meets Keynes. Okay, so he gets influenced by Keynes among other people, but Keynes has a big impact on him. Um, and then uh, the Second World War happens and he ends up working for the US government's Office of Price Administration. Um, now, during the war, the, the government was very worried that people were going to exploit the unusual conditions of the war um, and make lots of money, you know, so uh, make lots of money selling things to people that were in shortage. So the Office of Price Administration's job was to control prices and inflation uh, and to make sure the US economy didn't collapse or become destabilized because of the wartime production. And all of these experiences, um, you know, starting off in agriculture, I guess, um, working at Harvard, meeting Keynes, working for the US government's Office of Price Administration, all of this would shape his economic thinking. So these experiences are key to the way that he formed and framed his theory. Another interesting point um, for those of you who are tuning in from Tupper University is that Galbraith um, was the US ambassador to India from 1961 until 1963. Uh, and he was very close to Nehru. Uh, so he um, often gave advice uh, on economic issues to the Indian government, even though that wasn't his officially his job, uh, but it was something he ended up doing, right? Um, he's also famous for creating one of India's first computer science research departments um, at IIT Kanpur. So he was one of the founding members of that department. And uh, because of this, because of his long relationship with India and service to India, he gets awarded the Padma Bibhushan in 2001. So a little bit of interesting information. Uh, about Galbraith and his ties to India just there. So um, now let's look at his perspective on the economy. And um, the biggest thing to notice immediately is that last topic, neoclassical economics, was all about technical analysis and mathematical modeling, right? If we want to be good at the economy, we have to study maths and that sort of thing. Galbraith absolutely rejects this approach. And he says, actually, we don't need techn technical analysis. We don't need maths to study the economy, because that way of looking at the economy doesn't represent reality, right? So Galbraith argued there's no such thing as an economic law. Um, so therefore we shouldn't study the economy as if economic laws exist. Instead, things like politics and culture um, are the things that have a huge impact on economic factors. 
And so Galbraith then moved on to say, well, because politics and culture are the things that have the biggest impact, you know, these are things we can explain to people uh, if we try, right? So we should write about the economy in a way that everybody should understand, not just policy people in the government and academic people, right? Um, so his entire approach to writing about the economy was governed by the way he thought about the economy and the way he thought about the economy was governed by this idea that it's actually not as complicated as it seems, which is probably what I like if you wanted to take the point of this course overall and um, the way I'm encouraging you to think about the economy is that it's actually not as difficult as it seems, right? It's Galbraith's point in a way, not, not mine, um, that it's not as difficult as it seems. You can do it. All you need is a little bit of perspective and a little bit of understanding about politics and the society. And you can probably understand most of what happens in the economy. Okay. Now, all of his most famous books each introduce one major concept, right? I've listed them here. American capitalism, the concept of countervailing power, the great crash of 1929, the affluent society and the new industrial state. We're going to look at those concepts right now. So in the book, American capitalism, the concept of countervailing power, um, the key concept here is countervailing power. Okay, so Galbraith is going to um, begin the book, surprisingly, by stating his agreement with Hayek, right, one of the neoclassical people we looked at uh, in the previous topic. And he says the price system will fulfill its function only if competition prevails. That is if the individual producer has to adapt to price changes and cannot control them. So saying, yes, Hayek, you're right. Um, if, if competition is a reality, uh, then you know the price system is gonna work exactly like you say. But then he moves on and says, but that's not how things work. The economy is mostly not competitive, okay? What is it if it's not competitive? Galbraith argues it's an oligopoly. So this is a market where it's dominated by a small number of large corporations. And because the market's dominated by a small number of large corporations, for the most part, that's why Galbraith argues that, well, uh, this whole competition system isn't really what happens in the economy. Some other stuff is gonna happen instead. And what he suggests is the producer now has measurable control over his prices. Hence, prices are no longer impersonal force selecting the efficient man, forcing him to adapt to the most efficient mode and scale of operations and driving out the inefficient and incompetent. One can as well suppose that prices will be an umbrella which efficient and incompetent producers will tacitly agree to hold at a safe level over their heads and under which we all live comfortably, profitably and inefficiently. Right, so here, what we're saying, you know, neoclassical economics says the price system is an efficient system. Uh, it'll eliminate um, all of the inefficient producers. It'll competition will make the system as good as possible, as efficient as possible. That's how it's going to work. Galbraith suggests no, because of the ability of these uh, major corporations to control the prices of production, um, they're kind of going to sit above this uh, above this competition quite a bit because they're not in real competition with each other. Uh, and that's going to enable inefficiency, uh, but profit at the same time as inefficiency to be the normal way the system works. So Galbraith said it's pretty natural that firms are not just going to try and compete with each other. If they're smart, they're going to band together and try and influence prices together, okay? And you know, if you were a capitalist, that's kind of what you do. You try and form cartels or partnerships or relationships uh, that gave you greater control over prices and profits. So therefore, why isn't it seen as normal that workers band together and do the same thing? If it's normal that firms band together and try and influence prices, Galbraith's point is it's normal that workers band together and form, and, and form groups, which we call labor unions, um, that also try and influence prices, right? So labor unions are the countervailing power to capitalist oligopolies right labor unions are the countervailing power the balancing power i guess um so government is also a form of countervailing power and galbraith said that if there is no countervailing power but it's needed it's government's job to create this countervailing power all right so this is why his theory is associated with social balance i guess if there is an imbalance in the system if only the capitalists, for example, have this, uh, you know, oligopoly conditions and influence, the government needs to step in and create labor unions, right? Give the workers a voice so that they can balance out the power of capital. 
So Galbraith's concept of countervailing power says this is the normal way of capitalism. And not only is it normal, it's necessary because without countervailing power, we create an unstable system. Now there is an exemption, there is an extra rule so that if you don't want countervailing power, what you can have is state control over the economy. You know, so at the time Galbraith is writing, you know, a number of societies had very high levels of state control over the economy, the Soviet Union, um, you know, uh, any other planned economy where the, the state is playing a much bigger role in uh, managing and controlling production and consumption. And he's saying that's the alternative, right? Uh, either you have private enterprise with countervailing power or you have state control over, over the economy. You know, those are the only ways you can create a stable system. Um, without those things, you'll have an unstable system. So private decisions could and presumably would lead to the unhampered exploitation of the public, workers, farmers, or others who are intrinsically weak as individuals. All right, so he's saying groups of people that either can't or haven't tied themselves together into this larger organization to protect themselves are going to be weak, right? Um, as a result, he really wants the government to intervene to protect these people, right? Uh, because otherwise they're just gonna get crushed, okay? And in order to, and if they get crushed, that'll create social instability, right? So either these people band together and organize themselves, and if they can't or won't, government has to do it. So next in the Great Crash, uh, Galbraith studies the economic crisis of 1929, the Great Depression, and the reasons it happened. And a lot of economic thinkers study this because it's kind of a pivotal moment in, in world political and economic history. So Galbraith's argument is that a speculative bubble was caused by the US stock market. You know, and this is where you can see his Keynesian influence comes into play. You know, so he's worried about speculation. What's wrong with speculation? Well, we've discussed this a little bit in class, but um, for Galbraith, the biggest problem with speculation is it creates a public belief that it's possible for people to become rich, not by working, right? So we're not productively working. We're just playing the market, so to speak, like a casino game, you know? Um, so the end result of this is there's gonna be structural damage to the economy. More and more people are gonna be brought out of production and into the speculative aspects of the economy. You know, um, which is going to mess with the prices and stuff and uh, which is going to cause the speculative bubble, which is going to cause the crash when it all falls apart. So what's a speculative bubble? That's when prices become separated from reality. A really good, easy to understand example of a speculative bubble is property prices. Now, um, you know, property prices seem to be governed by how much property gets traded. So if everybody believes um, that housing is going, housing prices are going to go up. Everybody buys and sells houses a lot. And actually it's the buying and selling of houses and the belief of the price rise that's actually causing the price rise. There's nothing inherent in property that makes it grow in value. Actually, you know, like everything else, you know, a house that becomes old over time um, should become worse, uh, should become less valuable, but it doesn't. Why doesn't it? Well, his argument is that it doesn't because of speculative bubbles. So the social belief exists that we can make money by trading property. And because we believe that, that causes an actual increase in price. Right? So there's nothing objective about the price increase. Only our belief in the price increase creates the price increase. Okay, so uh, Galbraith noted that if we want to understand this a bit deeper, uh, we need to look at the social ideologies in play. So in the US, there's a concept called American exceptionalism. Um, it's a way of thinking that basically says the US is a superior country destined for success and destined to spread freedom and democracy and justice to the rest of the world. Okay. Part of this belief, um, he noted, is that if we look at the US middle class, there's a widespread belief that because America is an exceptional country, uh, because it's superior to everybody else, um, therefore, God or some other power intended the American middle class to be rich, right? So it's this belief, a faith, a literal faith that, that a spiritual power wants you to be rich leads to price increases in this case. So then if we look at the crisis of 1929, a bit more in depth, um, if we remember from the previous topic, the monetarist said there were changes in the money supply um, and this caused the crisis. And Galbraith completely rips this idea to shreds. So to summarize his analysis, uh, firstly, 
Galbraith said there was massive income inequality. Um, and this meant that the economy became dependent on um, investment and luxury consumer spending. So there wasn't a mass market for consumption yet. You know, it got that way that you know, most of the working class couldn't consume most of the products that they made. Okay, so income inequality contributed to the crisis. Next, um, the corporation structure contributed to the crisis. So holding companies and trusts, um, companies that basically were there for tax evasion purposes or just to manage money through the financial system, this encouraged speculative activity. Next, we have the structure of banking. Um, so having private banks that were all independent from each other and not that well regulated meant that if one bank failed, um, the other banks were likely to fail too because they're all lending money to each other and borrowing money from each other. You know, and the pressure of the, that happens on one bank is going to lead to pressure on the other bank. You know, because these banks exist in order to make profit, um, it's not like a state-owned bank which uh, doesn't care so much about that and can just say, well, you know, we're going to set a very at the bottom of the crisis is here because we legislate for it that way. Okay, and then we have imbalances in trade. So this is similar to Keynes' argument. Um, and he noted that at the time, actually, the US was a creditor state. It's funny that they're not anymore. Um, these days, the US is in debt to everybody else. But back then, um, the US was a creditor state, which means they were exporting more to other countries um, than they were importing. And there were high tariffs on imports. Okay, so um, when other governments defaulted on their debts, you know, this is what Keynes was worried about. Um, if the other government said, okay, we can't pay, or okay, we won't pay, um, that had a huge impact on the US economy. It's like, uh, okay, how are we going to get our money back? Uh, we sort of invested based on the idea that we're going to get paid at some point. Right? Um, and then lastly, he was very critical of economists themselves. So the intelligence of the economic thing is the intelligence of economists. And here's a direct quote. He says, economists and those who offered economic counsel in the late 20s and early 30s were almost uniquely perverse. And the burden of reputable economic advice was invariably on the side of measures that would make things worse. It's a very harsh criticism, right? Harsh, but probably fair criticism. Um, economists didn't really help matters, you know, and none of their advice was any good. All of their advice made the crisis worse. That was kind of Keynes' point. Galbraith says it even more aggressively. Okay, so in the book about the new industrial state, um, Galbraith's going to argue that as societies become more advanced, as production becomes more advanced, and this doesn't matter whether they're capitalist societies or socialist societies, he's noting that the more advanced our needs become, the more planning becomes necessary, right? So historically, we've thought of planning as associated with socialism and, you know, free market decision making as being associated with capitalism. Okay, but Galbraith is going to kind of demolish this argument and say planning is the new norm. All right, so um, this is another argument against theories of capitalism that are based on perfect competition and says that, well, if planning is normal, irrespective of the economic system you have, we should treat it as normal rather than treating it as a distortion to the market or that sort of thing. So what's the implication of planning? Well, it creates what he called a techno structure. So this is a group of people whose job it is to manage production in some way. And this techno structure are going to have a huge influence on the economy. And it doesn't matter whether they're corporate planners or government planners, you know, they're going to have a big impact on the way the economy works. So what defines the techno structure um, is that as a managerial class, as managers, they're not necessarily maximizing profit. Because if you want to absolutely maximize profit, as the neoclassical economists think that we should, um, that's going to involve a lot of risk. The techno structure don't want to take heaps of risks. They're happy to take some risks, but they're not going to take maximum risks. Okay, sounds logical. Um, so their goal is to maintain the existence of the organization. Rule number one, if you're in business or if you're in government, don't get thrown out of business, don't get thrown out of government. Okay. And if you survive, if, if you've met your survival criteria, only then you can extend um, to basically saying, well, what's the next important thing is that we grow our power, we grow our influence. You know, profit's kind of like a very later consideration, which we don't worry about as much. So 
The techno structure as seen as a rival of the shareholder, the shareholder wants to maximize profits. The shareholder has put their money in shares and is going to get dividends and that's profits, you know, and their money goes up or down by how much profits are getting made. But the techno structure is a bit different. Their position is determined by the stability and survival of the organization. And they become safer and more powerful when the organization grows its influence. Okay, in the book, The Affluent Society, this is where Galbraith moves into a critique of classical political economy. So Smith and Ricardo and those types of people. So The Affluent Society is Galbraith's most sold book, I believe, and there's a number of basically important discussions in it. We'll talk about those. So in terms of his classical political economy critique, um, Galbraith said that if there's one thing that defines the historical period that Smith, Ricardo and Malthus lived in, it's that we were way poorer than when we are now, right? Widespread poverty was the norm. And therefore, because we were poverty, um, most people were worried about basic goods. How do we get basic needs for survival? Now, his criticism then is, does that sound like the modern United States, for example, where everybody's in widespread poverty, nobody can eat, everybody's worried about basic survival goods. That doesn't sound like a modern developed country, right? It doesn't sound like the US after World War II. It doesn't sound like the US now. It doesn't sound like most of Europe now. There's a lot of places that aren't thinking the way that classical political economists think. So what is most production in the US designed to do? Galbraith argued, most production in the US is about satisfying wants instead of needs, right? Wants, not needs. So we're not trying to avoid death. We're trying to create you know, these luxury consumption commodities of various types um, and trying to create demand for these things as well, trying to convince people that they need, you know, I don't know, um, a PlayStation or an expensive car in order to be happy. Um, the next argument he makes is relation to gross domestic product, so GDP. And Galbraith is extremely critical of the idea that GDP is a good way of measuring the economy, a good way of measuring economic development, right? And a good way of measuring social and personal well being. Okay, now there's one way that he brings this in and say, okay, let's compare education services, which is supposed to make us smarter. I hope you're getting smarter by the second. Um, on the other hand, television equipment makes us dumber, right? TV makes us dumb. You should know that. <laughs> if you don't, um, you've probably already suffered the effects of TV. Okay. But GDP gives equal value to both of these things. It'll give a value to education services that makes us smarter. It'll give a value to television equipment, which will make us dumber, right? Um, even though one is, one is good and the other is bad. Now, one of the founders of GDP and this whole idea of national accounting was Simon Guznets. And when he invented this idea of GDP, uh, he gave a speech to the US Senate committee um, talking about what it means and stuff. And he's, basically giving them a warning, don't use this to measure development. Don't use this to measure the, 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 the improvement or in living standard. So he says the welfare of a nation can scarcely be inferred from a measurement of national income. In other words, he knew exactly what people would be tempted to do. It's like, oh, I've invented a counting system. Surely people are going to <laughs> take this and abuse it and apply it to situations where it doesn't belong. And he was right, because that's exactly what we did. So, you know, why should we listen to him? Well, because he helped invent the system, you know, uh, and that's kind of Galbraith's point as well. You know, why are we paying so much attention to GDP when even the inventor of GDP said it's a terrible measurement of development? So the next thing is that, well, what makes affluent societies, rich societies different? And his argument is because affluent societies are producing wants and not needs, demand is gonna work in a different way. Okay, so um, what he means by that is that in the United States, which was the case study that he used, demand was often not organic. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between organic and inorganic demand. Organic demand is like, we need to produce food um, because people must eat in order to live, right? People's hunger creates the organic demand for food that causes a certain level of demand for basic food commodities. Right, but the difference is in a consumer economy, demand is being generated not by people's hunger, so not organically. 
You know, a lot of corporations spend a lot of money on advertising, convincing us to buy things that we don't really need, you know, creating wants, creating desire for commodities. So there's nothing natural about it. And Galbraith's observation is that the expansion of private capitalism, when it's matched together with consumerism, um, has a negative effect. Okay, so the negative effect is there are lower levels of public investment and public spending. Okay, and this is going to be harmful in the long run because um, this is kind of like drawing on Adam Smith's knowledge is that, you know, well, there are certain areas which corporations just don't want to invest in um, because, because they're not profitable as much. So they can't get most profit out of it. Okay, so Galbraith is going to then say that, well, the same processes that create wants, such as corporations creating advertising and telling us that we want something, are the same things that satisfy wants. You know, so um, the corporations are both creating our desire for certain things and then satisfying that desire by producing those things and selling it to us. Okay, and what that means is that we're becoming increasingly dependent on these corporations. You know, and we can use this dependence uh, to explain something like brand loyalty, for example, which seems to make no sense. And so why would anybody be loyal to brand? A shirt's a shirt, a car's a car, a computer's a computer, right? Why are we so loyal to certain brands? Well, because they're both creating our needs and satisfying our needs. You know, we need them to feel good about ourselves in consumer society. So in terms of his policy advice, uh, Galbraith argued that for America or any society that is either affluent or wants to be affluent, um, they need to transition away from private investment and towards public spending. Okay, how are they gonna do this? basically by eliminating poverty, you know, so it's necessary. I mean, this is kind of tied to his observation about um, what caused the depression, uh, income inequality. So let's eliminate poverty. Let's give the poor people money to spend, you know, and that's a good thing. Massive government investment invention is needed in, in education is needed. So let's spend widely on raising the standard of knowledge that the average person has. And then he wants to actively promote what's called the new class. So who's the new class? Right, let's promote the growth of this new class and their power. The new class is us. Okay, if you're listening to this talk, if you're in a university, um, if you've ever studied at a university, you're probably trying to be part of what Galbraith called the new class. Right, teachers, professors, doctors, engineers, lawyers, civil servants, those types of people. Um, the people who have a big impact on society's progress, that's the new class. And Galbraith's point is, these people are actually, we need to give them as much power as possible. Okay, we need to promote their growth. So in order to do this, we need to use government's power to collect a lot of taxation revenue, right? And devote this revenue to public spending, right? Make sure people are educated and that sort of thing. And if we do that, the effect that's gonna have is a weakening of corporate power, right? So two ways corporate power is gonna be weakened if we collect high taxes and if we promote high levels of public spending. Firstly, people will have less money to spend on some of this junk that they don't really need, right? Take away people's money, they can't spend it, right? You spend it for them on stuff that's good for them. Okay, secondly, um, if we educate people, not everybody, but a good percentage of people are going to become smarter and smarter people are more resistant to things like advertising. So when a corporation tries to convince them that they need something, a smarter person is more likely to think, actually, I don't really need that thing. Actually, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna buy that thing. I don't really need it. So then he says that whether the problem be that of a burgeoning population and space in which to live with peace and grace, or whether it be the depletion of materials nature has stocked in the earth's crust and which have been drawn upon more heavily in this century than in all previous time together, or whether it be that of occupying minds no longer committed to the stockpiling of consumer goods, the basic demand on America will be on its resources of intelligence and education. And I think this quote is a good way of summarizing that, you know, no matter what problem the society is actually facing, Galbraith's perspective says we can solve this problem by raising the average of int intelligence of the public. So education is a special pr process in a way um, that it behaves differently from different forms of spending. You know, it, it changes the way we think, it changes demand itself. So unsurprisingly, he made a lot of people annoyed with these, uh, these theories because you know, that's attacking corporations, that's attacking neoclassical economics, that's attacking shareholders. 
you know, there are a lot of people are going to be upset and nonetheless they were. So Milton Friedman, one of the neoclassical economists we looked at last week, said this, many reformers, Galbraith is not alone in this, have as their basic objection to a free market that it frustrates them in achieving their reforms because it enables people to have what they want, not what the reformers want. Hence, every reformer has a strong tendency to be averse to a free market. You know, and um, you know, Milton Friedman's point is that he strongly believes in this idea that consumers are rational spenders, right? That they they know what they want, what they want is valid. We should just let them go out and spend on whatever they want. Okay. And it really comes down to what you believe here about, about the society. Is the consumer a rational spender? Yes or no, right? Um, you know, that, that really will determine whose position you take in this debate. Galbraith is also criticized by some bitter economists. And a good example of this is you know, the uh, Nobel Prize winner of um, Paul Krugman. And in the book, Peddling Prosperity, his biggest criticism of Galbraith is a strange one. He's like, you know, you spent too much time sharing your knowledge with the public. And what an awful criticism, honestly. <laughs> your biggest problem with somebody uh, is that they try and make the economy more understandable for the public as a whole, instead of just focusing on convincing academics and you know researchers and policymakers. That's Krugman's big problem with Galbraith. So an interesting perspective. So in summary, uh, what can we learn from a thinker like Galbraith? Well, he kind of sidesteps this discussion of equilibrium economics. You know, he avoids the discussion about whether it actually exists or not by simply saying, well, I don't know, maybe in the past it did exist. When people were absolutely poor, maybe there really was an equilibrium, but it doesn't anymore because of a society changing to this affluent society um, where people are starting to consume not based on need anymore. People are starting to consume based on what? Okay, the next thing we can learn is that if Galbraith is right, Economic growth is not gonna answer all of our problems, okay? And in a lot of ways, it's gonna take some of our existing problems and make them worse, okay? Um, if we don't educate the society, for example, um, if we don't plan the society, simply growing is not necessarily gonna solve our problems. You know, it doesn't determine who gets what, it doesn't resolve speculative problems, it doesn't resolve income inequality problems, it leaves a lot of things open. Lastly, countervailing power is pretty normal um, in any society where there isn't a high level of state control, right? So this leaves us to two conclusions. Either we should learn to accept and agree with the idea of countervailing power. So believe that it's normal for businesses to become oligopolies and it's normal for um, workers and stuff to form labor unions, that's normal, right? Or we should prefer state control. So we should say, okay, uh, you know, we kind of hate the fact that businesses band together like that. We don't like labor unions very much either. Why doesn't we, why don't we just let the state plan the economy altogether, right? Um, we have way more advanced tools for planning than we did prior, you know, um, like the idea that a planned economy wouldn't work is kind of not a very smart idea anymore, because if you think what we can do with big data and computerization and stuff, you know, planning an economy would be way easier now than it ever was before. Why don't we just prefer state control? Those are the two better options. Next, we can learn that um, large corporations have a really big influence on our society. And often large corporations do things like creating demand for product when there's no reason for this product to actually exist. Right? So there's no natural reason. It's not like hunger. So organic demand is not there. So corporations manufacture demand. That's why we have advertising and marketing, okay? Next, um, Galbraith would point out that we should be friends with the techno structure. We should not be friends with shareholders. <laughs> um, shareholders are mostly speculators trying to get short-term profits. The techno structure is good uh, because they have a stake in the long-term survival and development of the economy and the society, right? That's what makes them reliable partners. Um, shareholders do not, when a shareholder stops making money in one company, they'll sell their shares and try and make money in another company. So they're fickle, right? Galbraith would also argue spending on education is always good, okay? Now, there's never a bad reason to do that. Um, you can always make the society better by making it more educated. Um, either people will become better at resisting bad information, you know, and it will weaken the power of corporations, um, or um, people have less money to waste on other junk, right? 
then we have crazy behaviors like speculation and consumerism cause a situation where private spending is high and public spending is low, right? So Galbraith helps us understand why is it that in societies that are getting quite rich, right? Societies that have quite a lot of money, or at least societies where individuals in the society have quite a lot of money. How are these people getting so rich at the same time as public infrastructure is so poor, right? Why are people driving expensive cars on terrible roads where there's garbage on the side of the road, for example? How does that make any sense? You know, so Galbraith's theory helps us understand how richness and poverty coincide and how one of the consequences of high levels of private spending is the public infrastructure and public services deteriorate, right? So um, these things also fail to get created in poorer societies with rich middle classes uh, because rich middle class people are mostly gonna spend the money on themselves. There's no way the government has to sort of transfer these people's money into public spending and into public consumption. So that's it for Galbraith. Um, he's offered a very new take on the economy. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's talk and thanks for listening.